Hello and welcome to Africa Business School. Looking at Morocco, Africa and the world, today we will discuss uh, the policies towards uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the implications of these policies for international trade, industrial strategy and the society as a whole. To navigate through these themes, we are joined by Dr. Jacob Kierkegaard, a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and the German Marshall Fund of the United States. So Jacob, uh, shall we take first a global outlook on decarbonization and speak about the three main actors, the US, Europe and China and their approaches towards decarbonization? Well, thank you, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, well, I guess I should start by saying that the interesting thing is we all face the same challenge. The, you know, global climate change is truly the global uh, issue for, for our generation. So in some ways, you would probably expect uh, different countries to try to solve this, or address this issue in the same way. Uh, but that, of course, is, is uh, wrong because it turns out that different countries or even large economies will solve the same problem in very different ways because they have very different circumstances and starting points. Uh, so if you, in terms of the strategies chosen uh, the, to address carbon uh, decarbonization typically reflects the general economic strategies that the countries have anyway. So if you take China, for instance, China is a country that uh, has, since the beginning of the reform era in the late 70s, essentially heavily subsidized investments of almost any kind. That's how they have driven growth. They have built electric, you know, high speed trains, better harbors, real estate, etc. And now the Chinese government is very, very heavily subsidizing also the production of green goods and services, so electric vehicles, batteries, solar panels, uh, etc. And this is uh, very beneficial. It means that China produces a lot of this, but it also means that China will have overcapacity in these things. So they will export a lot of uh, uh, these cars and solar panels around the world, which is of course something that every country in the world, including Morocco and the African continent will have to adjust to. Mm -hmm. If you take the United States, for instance, <clears throat> the situation is very different. Uh, the United States has not introduced a carbon price, uh, which when you think about it, that the US is the biggest producer of oil and gas in the world, is probably not so surprising. I mean, they are they produce more oil than Saudi Arabia and far more natural gas than Qatar. Um, and they have a very large trade deficit uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, so what the US government has done, and, and by the way, they are in this sort of strategic competition with China, geopolitical rivalry, etc. So what the US has done is they have instituted a protectionist set of measures aimed at subsidizing production for the US market while blocking imports from China. Uh, but as I said, no carbon price uh, at all. And then there is the EU, which uh, has as the only major economy introduced a very aggressive carbon price, um, which if you think about it, the EU is one of the largest oil and gas importers in the world. So it actually sort of makes sense for the EU to try to reduce fossil fuel imports uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but obviously, if you have a carbon price that has its own uh, trade policy implications that are certainly very real uh, for uh, countries like Morocco, when the EU will begin to protect quote unquote, itself against uh, imports from countries that don't have uh, a carbon price. But as I said, the key point is that we're trying to address the same challenge, but in very different ways. And this leads to friction, particularly in trade. When we speak specifically about China and the way it subsidizes the green technologies, um, I know that in your view, this is a public good. Could you please uh, expand a little bit on this? Yeah. I mean, my view basically is that the biggest and most important challenge we face is climate change. And therefore, the overarching goal should be to decarbonize as soon as we can. And I believe very strongly that what will help us get there 
is if we get the foundational technologies for decarbonization in place as quickly as possible and at the lowest cost possible. That means, first and foremost, green electricity production. Uh, that means that, in my opinion, when China subsidizes the production of solar panels very heavily, uh, it already has economies of scale from the Chinese market itself. It means that Chinese produced solar panels will simply be, in my opinion, forever cheaper than solar panels from anywhere else in the world. Um, some will say, well, that's terrible because it means that we can't start uh, local production of solar panels in Morocco or in Europe or in the United States. And I would say, yes, that's probably true. But you, on the other hand, get below the cost of production, typically, solar panels that you can install in your economy and kickstart the green transition at home with green electricity uh, from these very low priced uh, um, Chinese solar panels. And that's what I mean when it's a, it's a global good. Uh, it's basically, I think we should say thank you to the Chinese taxpayer. All right, so does this mean for Africa that they shouldn't try to embark on exploring these new technologies themselves? Because we know that it would be a risky investment. Should they, should they even um, uh, try to incentivize local production of these technologies at home or rather consume, quote unquote, uh, the uh, ready product? I, I think that for a country, for a continent like Africa, you shouldn't make the mistakes that Europe and the United States have been doing. Uh, Europe has sort of toyed with the prospects of putting in place tariff barriers to Chinese solar panel exports and, and subsidize producers uh, in Europe of solar panels. The same is true in the United States. But as I said, the reality is that the Chinese producers are so big they are so advanced, and I think this is also important to understand, that Chinese solar production today is the most technologically advanced in the world. Uh, and they have this enormous home market in China. Uh, so Europe and the United States cannot compete with China, even with subsidies. So for Morocco and the African continent to devote much scarcer resources towards producing, uh, building a domestic solar panel industry, I have to say, I think is a poor use of resources and I think it should be avoided. It's much better to build, to buy them, frankly, at, you know, at very, very cheap prices from China and then kickstart the green transformation at home at a much lower cost. Speaking about green transformation and the production of green electricity, um, countries like Morocco have a particular advantage uh, being geographically close to Europe. So how could uh, this help um, Morocco in um, its position uh, uh, in the world economy, uh, trade partnership with the EU, specifically uh, given the new CBAM regulation uh, that the EU is imposing? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Morocco has lots of sun, and it has lots of space. Uh, those are, and it has the capacity to import uh, cheap solar panels from China. Uh, those are the three main components in kickstarting the green solar transition in Morocco. Uh, so I think that should be pursued. Uh, and, and because what is important for a country like Morocco is to really start the transition out of fossil fuels and really get an adequate amount of renewable electricity into the grid and that's what solar is there for now it won't be the only part of the solution you will need batteries or maybe you need nuclear power plants i mean you know there there it's not the only solution but for morocco i certainly believe it would be by far the largest part of the uh, green electricity production then when you have that then clearly morocco needs to figure out uh, what should we just export green power to europe for instance I think that would be a terrible mistake. Uh, what Morocco needs to do is that it ha because it will be, in my opinion, able to produce green electricity from solar, maybe also from wind, but certainly from solar, at a cheaper price than in Europe, then Morocco needs to think about, okay, what products, what green industrial products should we produce in Morocco downstream 
using this green electricity and then use those products at home and certainly export them uh, to the rest of the world and not least uh, in Europe. Because if when Morocco begins to uh, produce or export to Europe these type green products manufactured with, with green electricity, then Europe's carbon border adjustment or CBAM mechanism, which is just this idea that you put a tariff on imports based on the carbon content of the production of the good being exported to Europe, goes away because it is produced in Morocco with renewable energy. Well, then, then CBAM goes away. Uh, and this will be true not just in Europe, this will be true in many countries around the world. Mm. Uh, and be, but again, because I think Morocco will have access to cheaper renewable energy than probably in Europe, uh, Morocco should exploit that uh, comparative advantage to produce in Morocco as many uh, green goods and services using that energy as it can. So we know that CBAM started with um, just spanning um, a few industries, but now this has expanded. Uh, so do you see any particular risks for countries like Morocco or uh, other African countries? Or in the view of what you just said, we shouldn't worry about it? Oh no, Morocco and, and African countries should worry a lot about it. Uh, Morocco shouldn't worry about it when it has fully decarbonized. Right. Uh, then, it's, then it is not an issue. But Morocco, uh, and especially of course OCP and the phosphate uh, industry, is already affected by CBAM. It's one of those sectors covered by CBAM. So it will gradually, from 2026 to 2034, be subject to the full uh, European carbon price. Uh, and because the carbon price in Europe today is about somewhere about 60 euros a ton, which is quite high, Uh, the political pressure in Europe to expand CBAM to cover many more subjects, uh, put, uh, uh, goods and, uh, and services, potentially even agriculture, uh, uh, which might also be affected. Uh, well, then uh, the problem for Africa especially will be, well, then you will not be able to export agricultural goods, for instance, or any other good if you are not yourself fully decarbonized. Uh, so absolutely, Morocco uh, and the African continent should pay very close attention to this. And it is, in fact, in my opinion, not the main reason, because the main reason is domestic. You want to decarbonize for the, you know, for the future of your own country and the health benefits, etc. But trade-wise, uh, those countries that trade a lot with Europe, um, this is going to be Uh, very soon, by far the biggest trade barrier that they will face. And certainly, this is true for Morocco and phosphates. What are the implications of uh, these effectively barriers in terms of the World Trade Organization? Uh, what connections do we see and whether, uh, whether these commitments uh, that countries have made to free trade uh, are going to put um, any, any boundaries on our way towards decarbonization? Well, I think big picture wise, uh, you can say that certainly Europe, uh, but most countries, if they're forced to choose between free trade and WTO commitments and what they themselves determine is politically necessary to, to decarbonize, they will choose to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, green barriers of trade If you ask EU, the EU, they will say, oh, uh, CBAM is entirely WTO compliant because there's no, in principle, there's no difference between an importer and an exporter. They're paying the same price, you know, but it's very difficult to Level determine point. precisely how much an importer or an exporter would have to pay, etc. But, but they will say there's no problem. But the reality is, is even if there was found to be a problem, the EU wouldn't care. And today, it's also the fact that a lot of the subsidies and trade protectionism that the U.S. is doing is very clearly not compatible with WTO, but the U.S. doesn't care. And it doesn't matter whether it's Trump or Biden, Republicans or Democrats, they won't care. They will prioritize decarbonization or indeed protectionism more general. So, unfortunately, the role of the WTO on these issues going forward, I think, will be uh, quite small. 
When uh, countries like Morocco afford protectionism in the same way as the U.S. or the EU? And the, answer, the short answer to that is no. Uh, but I think more importantly, in terms of protectionism, because you know what we're talking about here is the often the formative inputs into the green transition. You know, solar panels, particularly, I would say, is relevant, most relevant for Morocco. You know, it is a particularly bad idea to try to be protectionist because even if you shut out Chinese imports and try to build them at home, they're going to be much more expensive. Uh, uh, that is simply the character of the solar panel uh, uh, market and production. And again, speed is of the essence. So I think protectionism for a country like Morocco is an even worse idea. It's still a bad idea for US and Europe, but it's even worse for Morocco, I would say. So speaking of Morocco, it has uh, recently adopted a very ambitious decarbonization strategy uh, for the horizon of 2050. Uh, we're almost uh, at uh, zero um, uh, net emissions, decarbonized electricity mix. Um, increasing electrification of most sectors, uh, sustainable agriculture and forestry, uh, developing them as carbon sinks, and lastly, um, smart cities. Uh, what do you think about uh, the Moroccan strategy that you have had a chance to, uh, to look at? How does it compare uh, globally? Do you think it is ambitious? Do you think it is feasible? No, it's certainly very ambitious. I mean, in, in many ways, it is, a, it is a strategy that puts Morocco fully on par with most uh, developed economies, the EU and others, uh, because it basically lays out a, a fully net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, and I think it is, uh, and it has very ambitious components. I mean, the fact that it sh you shouldn't be able to buy a combustion engine motorcycle in Morocco in six years, in 2030, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, but more importantly, it's a holistic picture. It is clearly that the Moroccan government has looked at how do we need to change not just the economy, but society, the way Moroccans live, uh, which will be necessary. Uh, uh, that is the scope of decarbonization. So I like the trans I like the, the, the way, the plan, the ambition very much. Uh, the one thing that I will say is... Um, I think that uh, the plan makes a big bet on the use of hydrogen in transportation for trucks. 50% of Moroccan trucks are supposed to be hydrogen driven by 2050. I personally think that's a big bet because the technology uh, is not yet developed and hydrogen driven trucks will be competing not against fossil fuel trucks, but against electric trucks. And I think that is is uh, uh, that technology technology race is not settled yet. And then the the strategy is quite. It says Morocco should introduce a carbon market. I think carbon markets is the right way to go, but they're also hugely controversial. It's very redistributive. Who should pay the carbon tax? What should the level should the carbon tax be at? And when should it be introduced? The plan says nothing about that, uh, so I think the Moroccan government is going to have to put some, some meat on those bones very soon. That's right, and look at the EU experience. Uh, hopefully learn, some of the, learn from the lessons, uh, mistakes and good things of what the EU has done, absolutely. Because Moroccan plan is so ambitious, it clearly requires a very substantial investment. So uh, what kind of financing do you, do you see as the most fit for this purpose? Well, I mean, in my opinion, because we are funded, I mean, we're literally changing the planet for future generations. I mean, that, that's literally what this is about. Ourselves as well, but mostly for our kids and grandchildren. Because of that, because the scope of what we're doing is a once in a, you know, not even once in a generation, but once in a civilization, or whatever you want to call it, once in a thousand year energy transition uh, that we're doing, uh, uh, it needs to also be financed by future generations, in my opinion. And that means that it should be overwhelmingly debt financed. Uh, we should issue a lot of very long-term debt that to finance the investments that we need to make in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, 
And then it should also be future generations that will benefit from breathing the cleaner air, uh, etc. Uh, they will also have to pay part of that bill through repayment of that debt. So absolutely, in my opinion, this should be uh, uh, overwhelmingly debt financed. What are the social implications of decarbonization in both short term and longer term? Well, I mean, first of all, we avoid really bad things happening. We don't quite know what those bad things are, but when we look at the potential for drought, uh, you know, rising sea levels, uh, all these uh, sort of tail end possible events if temperatures rise too much, right? We don't know what they will be, but I feel confident in saying they will be really bad. We avoid all that. That's probably the biggest, uh, if you like, benefit. But we don't know what the benefit is because we don't know what the downside is, right? So that's, it's a little hard to argue that. But then for everyone, especially people living in large cities, and particularly in large cities in many developing countries, including Morocco, um, is a fully electrified energy system means much, much cleaner air. Uh, and that will help, you know, health. It will mean also just less noise. People don't realize how noisy cities are. But, you know, and a fully electrified city is much less noisy. Uh, and, and again, we're talking about things like, you know, psychic, uh, sort of mental health and these types of things, ability to sleep. It'll be, there's a huge amount, generally a huge amount of intangible benefits of decarbonization for society as a whole. And my last question would be, how do you think Morocco and countries like Morocco, other African countries, take best advantage of this global journey towards decarbonization? Well, I think the, the first uh, thing is that, that we, you know, one should really take full advantage of the global economy. Uh, because what the global or globalization does, especially China, but also companies from around the world, is they produce the goods at the lowest possible price. And if you want to kickstart the green transition, especially in countries with less resources than, say, the EU or the US or China, like Morocco, like African countries, you have to be price conscious. Uh, you should always pay uh, the lowest price for the most core fundamental components of the green transition. And that certainly means you shouldn't do protectionism, uh, uh, but you should start now, which is, of course, what the Moroccan transition uh, plan is, is, is aiming to do, because this will, the, the barriers to economic interaction with Europe and with other countries because of this will only grow. Uh, so time really is of the essence. Jacob, thank you very much for your insights today. Pleasure. So, to subsidize or not to subsidize, free trade or green barriers, and finally, who should pay for the green transition? These are some of the questions that we have discussed today with Jacob Kierkegaard. Thank you so much for watching.